So let's sing this song about creating a clean home. Selected, 
Okay? To him, or excuse me, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. See, you couldn't argue with him. There were too many witnesses of what went on. Uh, including, he, he liked to cook and eat. Did you know that? Y'all know anybody in this part of the country likes to cook and eat? Some are better at both than, than the other. Most of us are better on the consumption side. But, but Jesus made sure that he ate in front of them after his resurrection to show that he wasn't a ghost. He was really there. A, a real resurrection. To whom he presented himself alive after suffering many infallible truths, being seen by them during the 40 days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. He said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from today. He says, guys, and he's still teaching those 40 days. Jesus didn't waste time. He said, hang around because you're fixing to receive the Holy Spirit. Now remember, this is the genesis of the church. Now, when you get the Holy Spirit, believing in Jesus, you'd find that in, in Ephesians 1.13. It's when you believe. And listen, not believe that He exists. I believe that uh, Buddha existed. I don't believe that He's God. Right? And, 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 I, and Satan believes that Satan, ex, I'm not sure, Satan believes that Jesus exists, but he doesn't see him as Lord, the one that he's following, his leader, obviously. Amen? What does it take to be saved? According to Scripture, confess with your mouth, Jesus is your Lord, your leader. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Does it say which denomination? No. It says what? Jesus. Uh, a denomination is the vehicle that we're worshiping through. Our culture of worship or what have you. But if, if you've made Jesus your Lord, your leader, the one that you're following, He's going to get you to where He is and where is He? In heaven. Right? And so that's what the Bible says. Romans 10, 9. Okay? Uh, how many knew that it was 40 days from, from His crucifixion until His ascension? Okay? And then 50 days, what happened? The day of Pentecost, what happened? The Holy Spirit came, and they could see the effects of the Holy Spirit on, on the people who believed. And, and many were saved at that time. Did you know that God's got a calendar for how He puts all this together? Where are we on God's calendar right now? Where would you say we are on God? Are we closer to the beginning of, 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 of the time after Christ, or closer to the, the time when He's going to come back for His people? What do you think? I don't know the exact date, but I can tell you a lot of the signs seem to be there. I want to look at one of his calendars real quick. Uh, look at that with me in the book of Daniel. It's going to sound a little bit confusing, listen, I'm going to throw this in there every now and then so that it becomes more familiar and we don't kind of choke on just the, the, the prophecy that's being speaking, spoken. Have you ever heard something once and twice and maybe the third time? You said, oh, okay, now I kind of breaks down for me. So I'm going to throw this calendar out there and it starts this way. 77s are decreed for your people. How many are totally clear now and they got that figured out? Well, 70 weeks is sometimes called, but what it means is 70 sets of 7 years. That's a tongue twister. But who can do the math? What's 70 times 7? 490. So 490 years it is the time that he's talking about. Why he didn't say it that way, I don't know. Math always confused me anyway. But 70 sets are decreed for your people. Who was his people? Who was Daniel's people? The Jewish people. So that's their calendar. And they're going to be there until the day Jesus comes back after tribulation. So it's going to be 70 sets of 490 years for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for their wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. What that means is for him to finish his calendar, it's going to take 490 years. How many of y'all say, but it's already been more than 490 years? And it was way more than that even before Jesus, well, just when Jesus came back it was 490 years. Been another 2,000 since then. So he, he, he explains a little further. No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, that's Jesus, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens, that's 49 years, and there will be 62 sevens. And I'm not doing that math in my head right now, but anyway, it, it will be rebuilt with the streets, a trench, and the times of trouble. 
Alright, after 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death. How many of us read about that? We talked about it on Easter. So with that, 62 and 7, I can do that. From 62 and 7 to 69. When that time is up, Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. So that brings us up to where we are at the beginning of Acts. Okay? How many sets of 7 are left? If we've got 69 pushed out of the way and we've got how many left? 69 out of 70. How many is left? Somebody do that math. One. There's one set of seven left. And, and, and it, that didn't happen right when Jesus died. So something is going on from when that 69th set of seven years. And that next set comes. Anybody want to know what they call the last set of seven on earth? The seven years of what? Tribulation. Scary stuff. Revelations. Go, go read it out. I look forward, and I think the Bible kind of points to a pre-tribulation rapture when the church is already taken out of here. I hope that's the way it is, but either way, if you're in Christ, you're going to be okay. Amen? All right, well, why, why are we doing that? Let's go a little bit further, and then we're going to stop. We've got one, one and a half more verses. The, the, the uh, people of the ruler will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the ruler. Who, who's the prince of the power of the air, according to Scripture? Who, who's the, the ruler of the world? Notice there's a little R up there. It's Satan. How many of you can tell just by watching TV or watching the news that he's got a lot of influence on the world? Have you noticed that? And what's strange is people don't mind follow him. What does he say? If it feels good to him. Yeah, if it goes against God, man, that'll make you feel powerful. Just rebel and enjoy your power. It's telling God no, you know? And it seems to work because it's just pretty popular stuff, right, going on. Anyway, but the, the people of the ruler at that time was Rome, and Rome came in and they wiped out Jerusalem in AD 70. About 40 years or less than that after Jesus died. They wiped it out. So they destroyed the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue to the end. And desolations have been decreed. Have there been wars since then until now? <coughs> Absolutely. And he will confirm this. Here's, here's, here's your calendar. You ready? He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Well, there's only one seven left. Tribulation. And the many he's talking about, he's talking to Jewish people. In the middle of the seven, he will put it into the sacrifice and an offering. So now we know what the covenant, what the agreement was about. They got to get to what? The Jewish people got to start offering things in the temple again for seven years. But Satan's a liar. And he says, so in the middle of the seven, he'll put it into it. Remember that agreement we had? It's gone. It's washed up. And, and uh, at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes death. And at the end, the greed uh, uh, is poured out on him. Okay? So at the end, he's gone. He's wiped out. Brother Darrell, why are you telling us that? Well, what happened between when Jesus died and when this next set of seven starts? The church is born. That's what happened. The church is born. And we call this the church age. And, and you and I are in the church age. The calendar went fine up to 69 sets of seven. And then he cut it off and he says, now it's not just the Jewish people anymore. I open it up for you non-Jewish people, us non-Jewish people called the Gentiles. By the way, the first Christians were Jewish. And, and when they started following Christ, they didn't call them Jewish anymore. They called them Christians. So that's where we are somewhere in this church age between the 69th and the 70th set of seven years. How many of y'all are so clear right now? Finally, I get it and I understand it. Probably not. I have scratched my head every time, and you notice there's ball spots up there hey, when I get into that one. But what do we have to do now? Well, we talked a little bit about it during the Sunday school time today. What did God call us as He was leaving? Remember what He said as He was leaving? Go ye therefore and what? Make disciples, more followers. And if you follow Christ, where do you wind up? If you follow Christ, where do you wind up? Next to Him in heaven. You want to know how to get to heaven? Follow Jesus. How do you follow Jesus? What are you telling him? Jesus, you're my Lord. I believe you beat death. I, I believe that, that you were resurrected from the cross. And the Bible says you shall be saved. But saved to what? Sitting around the wait. Or use whatever talents and abilities that, that he gave you. Gifts that he gave you to help others get to heaven instead of hell. What's the most hateful thing we could do? Let our friends and family die and go to hell without giving it our best. Amen? 
And what he says is, is I will help you in that struggle. And, and where are we going to get the help? I'm glad you asked because that's the biggest part of the sermon. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8. Here's some good news. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. For those who said, Jesus, you're my Lord. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. In other words, it's more than just religious mumbo jumbo. It comes from the center of who you are. I, Jesus, you're my Lord. I do believe in you and who you are as the Bible says. Not what I can come up with in my head, but what the Bible says. You shall be saved. And so there's no condemnation for you. And listen, don't condemn anybody. And, and don't take it if somebody tries to condemn you. Just say, got the wrong person. Jesus said, His word says, I'm not condemned. Not because I'm so good, but because He chose to save me in spite of me. So there is no condemnation. And because you belong to Him, you ready? The power of the life-giving Spirit, capital S, do you see that? It's the Spirit of God. It's not up there. Then you're glad you're here. Now do you see that? You got a capital S on it? Good. It's the same as the back one. Uh, so I got it right that time. Thank you. Uh, the power of the life giving. How powerful is the life giving spirit? We spoke this morning about in Sunday school. Any body can, can take a life. You can do it accidentally. Right? You can do it on purpose. It ain't a whole lot to, to do. It's sad. It's sick. It's demonic. It's all those kind of things. Anybody can do it. Who can give a life? Who can give a life? Who can, who can give back to someone who's already died? Because he says that we, we are, are dead men walking. So let the dead bury the dead. Because we're condemned to death if we don't have someone who takes us off of death row. Right? And gives life back to us. And who is the only one that can do that? Remember? Because of my sin. One of them. Any one of them. Would have sent me to hell. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Right? And, and there was no other way helpless in, in that place until Jesus did what? Died without sin and, and literally gave me his righteousness or his innocence. And he took all of my uh, guilt, every bit of it. Uh, picture this. If you had a rap sheet, how many of us could imagine what our rap sheet of sin would look like? You know. Yeah, I'm not sure you would fit in this room. If you ever saw grandparents in the days before they had up their iPhones and, and they took out the kid, pictures of their kids, uh, grandkids, in their wallet, you remember what they did? They had the little rollout, flip things, all the plastic. And so picture that with our sin. You just keep on rolling out there with it. But what Jesus did is He took my rap sheet and He took your rap sheet when you make Him Lord of your life, the leader of your life, right? And He swapped. And so I have a blank for that rap sheet, and he's got mine that goes forever. And he says it was nailed to the cross and done away with buried. That's amazing. And what did I do to get it? Nothing good. My righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. And so if he gave it to me, he didn't get something in return, and I didn't do anything to earn it, then that's called something, it's called grace. Undeserved favor. And he offers it to who? And you see how my arms are? That's how he died. They said, you Christians, y'all kind of narrow-minded. The only way you get to heaven is through Jesus? You have an open arm. He died so everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? And we've talked about that before. It's okay to be narrow-minded about some things. If I'm going to swim for 10 minutes, I want to do it on top of the water. Would you agree that's a good place to swim if you're going to swim for 10 minutes? What happens if you don't have the, the gear and you try to swim underwater for 10 minutes? So I'm narrow-minded about that. I'm narrow-minded about which side of the highway. I, I'm not like Chris that's been driving in, in the English parts of uh, Australia and all. I, I, I'm going to drive on the right side of the highway because if I drive on the wrong side, things are going to happen. So I'm narrow-minded about that. I'm narrow-minded about where my kids get their drugs. I want to get it from a, a, a qualified doctor and pharmacist, amen? Something that's therapeutic to improve their health instead of rob their health. Do you agree with that? There's certain things I'm very narrow-minded about, and it is okay. I'm narrow-minded about what it takes to go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And you say, well, I, I like to be more broad-minded than that. 
you're going to miss Jesus. He said, there's only one way, and you're going to miss heaven. It took a while to get all that figured out. But even as a not so smart country boy, I got that figured out. Nobody else died for me. Nobody else swapped their sin record for mine. Nobody else paid my bill, my price, and took my death for me. And he did it out of love. So, anyway, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin. Sin was going to drag me to hell. My sin was. It leads to death. And we're talking about the ultimate death, the separation from God. Said so the law of Moses was unable to save us. Can your following the law of Moses save you? No, because you can't do it. It's impossible. Only God can do the impossible. Amen. Only God can do the impossible. And says so it was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. How many of you have a hard time fighting your sinful nature? How many of you have done something even today? I said, well, I wish I hadn't done that. That didn't honor God. Does that happen to you like it does to me? Probably does. Because we got what? A brain that thinks about self and we are active. We get our feelings hurt and we want to hurt somebody else. And all that kind of stuff that goes on in this broken way that we think. He said our sinful nature keeps wanting to come out and, and do things. So God did what the law couldn't do. He sent His own Son in a body like ours... Like we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. How many of us know we have a body that prefers not to do it God's way? Did you know that you have a body that prefers not to do it God's way? You have a brain and thought process and that. Does God know that? Absolutely. He knows that. We've got to admit it to ourselves. And, and how many of us know that, that we can't fix it by ourselves? That's why King David wrote that song, Creating Me a Clean Heart. He had just committed adultery. He had just had the, the, the husband killed. He was a murderer, an adulterer. And he said, that's not who I wanted to be. And yet, Paul, Paul himself said, who can save me from this wretched man that I am? What did he say? He sent his son. How much love did that take? You wonder why God shows up his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The, the, the love of a parent for a child shows how much he loved you that he would allow his son to go through that for you. The person sitting in your chair right now. It, it heightens the amount of love that he must have had to allow his son to suffer like that. And yet we know we serve only one God. But it gives us a picture of how much he loved you that, that he would allow that. Not only allow that, but it brought him pleasure to save you. Also, how much did he... Did Jesus love you? He says, yeah, I'll do this for him. How much did the Son love the Father? He says, I'll do this to please you. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. God didn't sweep it under a rug. God didn't take a payoff as the ultimate judge for you and me. It had to be paid. If the judge said, well, uh, you know, you're, you're fine as a $1.7 million. And if you don't do this, you're going to be locked up in prison for the rest of your life. How many of us would be out of prison the next day? Probably none of us. Right? But he's, he did what? He put the money down. He Not the money, but the payment down. In full. It's all paid for. I didn't have to pay it, but if it's paid, does the judge and the court care? As long as it's paid, I get to do what? Walk free. He met the full requirement of what had to be paid for me and for you. Through that. So, that's silly. Why? Can you think of one good reason he would do that? You know, it comes down to something intangible. Genuine love. See, he did that so the just requirement. He didn't bend the law. He fully followed God. Who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Now that's, that's where it gets kind of tough. The Bible says that you receive the Holy Spirit when you said Jesus is my Lord and meant it in your heart. And you knew who Jesus was. He was raised from the dead. He beat death. Amen. You received the Spirit. But then it comes back another place. says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, whose choice is it for us most of the time if we're going to get drunk with something? 
choice is ours. And then he turns around and says, be not drunk with wine, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. So whose choice must it be if we get to be filled with the Spirit? And he's talking to Christians. So if it's our choice for the wine, then it must be our choice for the Spirit. Right? Well, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It says you get baptized in the Spirit. That's, that's immersion. That's not how we do the water baptism. Full immersion. So you get all of the Spirit when you're saved, when you believe. Ephesians 1.13 again. So how are we not filled with the Spirit? Right, you mentioned earlier, if, if you greet people with joy, it takes our mind off a lot of other things and it shows a genuine gladness to see somebody. But that's a choice too. It says rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. In other words, you have to choose joy. And you and I get to choose to follow the Spirit of God or follow our own broken brains and sinful bodies. We get that choice. So being filled with the Spirit says, no to self and no to my way of thinking and yes to God's leading through His Spirit. Do you know the Word of God, the Bible said, is foolishness to those that don't have the Spirit? It's just, just words. But to those who have the Spirit, suddenly it starts making sense because it's spiritually discerned. Whose Spirit? It's not the Spirit of the mountain, the Spirit of the water, the rain God, or this and that. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Son. It's the same Spirit. One God. Amen? It's the all-powerful Spirit. So he did this, so it'd be done. And, and he says, we're not to follow our natural self. Naturally, I like to do things that please me. Doesn't that sound pretty natural to you? I mean, it's naturally like to do things that take care of us. He says, I want you to do something supernatural. Not think about self. Let me handle that. What does the Bible say? Seek first. Right? The righteousness of God and all these things will be added unto you. If you put me first, I'll take care of the rest. It says those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Let me ask some Christians. Now that we're Christians, we never think of sinful things. That, that was a joke. Nobody laughed. But it's also sad, isn't it? We shouldn't be laughing. Now, anyway, the point is what? We have broken thoughts in all this. Somebody hurt us, what do we want to do? Hurt them back. Twice as much. That goes beyond an eye for an eye, doesn't it? You know, somebody humiliates us, we want to humiliate them. Somebody put us in the corner, we want to push it back. We want to do all those kind of things. We don't get our way. How many of us can feel pretty good fit? And blame somebody. We're pretty good at that too, aren't we? That's our sinful nature. Right? He says, we can be dominated. He says, those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit Think about things that please the Spirit or please God. Amen? The Holy Spirit is God. And, and where is the Holy Spirit? In every Christian, everybody who is called upon the name of the Lord. Right? Meaning the authority of the Lord. Meaning under His authority. Because we uh, accepted that hand of grace that reached down to pick us up and save us from hell. And we did it by making Him Lord of our life. How are you controlled by the Spirit of God? Well, one, you, you need to be able to recognize the Spirit of God. What's the Spirit of God look like? Trick question. You can't see it. Remember? The Spirit is like wind. You can't see the Spirit, but you can see His effects. Amen? In the wind. How many of you saw the wind that blew down all the trees that we were talking about earlier? You didn't see the wind. What did you see? limbs and tin and everything else flying through the air, but you didn't see the wind, did you? How powerful was the wind? Extremely powerful. It's the same with the Spirit. You won't see the Spirit, but you'll see the what? The effects of the Spirit. And, and so, think about that. Allowing the, the Spirit to control us. And how are we going to know it's the Holy Spirit? It will line up with what? It will line up with Scripture. Always. God doesn't twist thing. God doesn't change the rules and all those kind of things. He offers His grace and He tells us the standards to His rules. But He offers His grace and He doesn't undo any of that. So it has to line up with Scripture. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Do you know we can do things as Christians in our mind 
that, that don't follow the Holy Spirit, and follow our own thinking, and it can kill us. It can kill those around us. We can make some bad choices, can't we? That can lead to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Leads to life and peace. You mean if I quit fighting God and start trusting Him and following Him, I can have life and peace? And even if it's not in this world, I can have eternal life and eternal peace? You mean I don't have to fight that battle every day? I can just go ahead and decide right now I'm going to do it God's way? And, and I don't have to wonder if I'm doing right, wrong, or in between? I can just trust God and go that way? You know what that's called? Resting in the arms of Jesus. It's called leaning on His understanding. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Things that don't change. No matter what happens on this earth. This earth is going to burn away. The Bible says not from global warming caused by man. But because God is going to make that happen at a certain time. And give us a new heaven and a new earth. He has to renovate. Right? Because there's so many things that we've messed up. Letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. Well, sin is the opposite of God. So after. How could it be any other way? The sinful nature is going to go against God. The Bible says sin's fun for a season. Do I have a witness? Does anybody want to tell me about the sinful time they had and it was a lot of fun for a season? No, we don't want to bring all that out. But at the same time, did it happen? Yeah, it sure did. Amen? And for a little while, we felt powerful. We felt like we had everything under control. And then what happened? There's wonderful sermons about sin will always take you further than you want to go. Make you pay more than you want to pay. Keep you longer than you want to stay. All those kind of things go into those sermons. Because in the beginning it's fun. And then before you know it, it's got you more than you got it. Sin is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws. And it never will. Is there any compromise with sin? We've spoken before. Sin's like cancer. How many of us say, well that much of cancer in my body is acceptable? Do we say that? What do we want? It gone. Amen? And that's what sin is. Much more deadly than cancer. Cancer can only kill the body. Sin can drag us to hell. Amen? Sinful nature can never please God. Letting that become our normal operation, making that natural for us, is something that we battle. How long do we battle? I talk to people who have alcohol and drug addictions. And those who have stopped will tell you 30 years later, I'm still an addict or an alcoholic. I have to fight it every day. That's amazing. Did you know that, that I'm a sinaholic? I have to fight it every day. I have to take up my cross daily. And, and sometimes I lose that fight. I slip, but I'm still going to fight. I talked to a precious mom uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and, and uh, she said, uh, her daughter was in rehab. I said, well, that's, it's good that she's there. She said, you don't understand this is her third time. I said, well, that's wonderful. Uh, she, she said, no, it's not. It's three times. And, and it's still hitting her. And I said, no, she's still fighting. Amen? She's still fighting. She had not give up the fight. How many of us are still fighting the sin problem we have in our life? It, it, we won't get that fixed until we get there. But every day we get to fight it and say, God, I love you more than what I'm doing. And I want to show it to you. And so I'm going to fight that. And then we get together in group meetings like this and we support one another in that fight. Because we ain't got it all fixed. He's got it fixed for eternity. But if we're going to be effective in this life, we can't be living both ways, can we? If we do, then we mislead people. We say, God's not worth it. Jesus died, it's on Him. I get to do what I want to. What kind of message is that? He said, if we're going to lead people, then we need to lead by following Christ. And He's not going to lead us into sin. He's going to lead us where? Towards that perfection. And if others are going to see how to get there, we need to be following the right kind of a way. That's a big difference in God don't love you because you sin. I'm talking about the Christian. It, it's now a question, I'm loving God because I fight the sin with God's help. Remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I can show my appreciation by battling that sin and saying He's worth better for me. 
And those that don't know about Him, they need to see a clear path to God and not something wishy-washy where today I'm going to act this way and tomorrow I'm going to act that way. If I can be under the, 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 the power of the Holy Spirit, because I can't do it absolutely empowerless against it without His help. But if I can be under His power, then hopefully I can make a clear enough path for somebody else to, to follow. And by the way, I hope you're making a clear enough path for me to follow. Because we all get weak, don't we? We all get weak. So, but you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit living in you. It is amazing to me sometimes when I'm not thinking about God or seeking to be filled with the Spirit that all of a sudden God will put me in a place and, and I catch myself being used of God and I say, well, how did I get that privilege? And how did that happen? Well, the Holy Spirit is there. When will He lead you or forsake you? Never. And He has permission to take full control any time, but more often than not, He wants me to do it so I can show Him that I love Him. He says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? It's Jesus, right? But we didn't get the Holy Spirit until Jesus. But if we got Jesus, we've got the Holy Spirit according to Scripture. So the difference between a Christian and non-Christian, one has the Holy Spirit and one does not. One has the Spirit in them. And I don't know if you know it. If you're saved, every time you go somewhere, you're taking the presence of God with you. And it's going to make some people nervous. You, you, ever, you ever been in a place and people just kind of get nervous around you? You don't know why and what's going on? <laughs> but it's the Holy Spirit's present. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you remember, the demons got really upset when Jesus come around. Right? But all that kind, of, kind of happens. And, and, and if you make people uncomfortable, they may kind of send some fire shots at you. Guess what? You're in spiritual warfare. And that individual there, that individual is not your enemy. What's the enemy? The Bible says we battle not against the flesh and blood. We battle against what? The principalities of this dark world. So there's spiritual warfare going. And you get to be what? In the battle for some precious soul that hopefully won't wind up in hell. We have something to do while we're here on this earth. Remember, those that do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. How did you get right with God? You got Jesus to sin list and He buried yours. Took it to the cross with Him. Amen? And yes, this body will die. When you get my age, that doesn't concern you like it used to. It starts kicking back. It doesn't do the, the things it used to do. And at least not without an aching back or two or three weeks of, of this pain or that pain and all those other kinds of things. But He's going to give us a brand new one according to Scripture that won't have those issues in it and also won't mislead my thinking anymore. That create me a clean heart. He's going to create me a whole clean body that won't go that way. And that battle will be settled. It's already settled in the sense there's no condemnation, but I won't have to fight it anymore. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as Christ raised, just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies, bodies that can die, by this same Spirit we're living in you. He's going to give you an immortal body. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Isn't that neat? You're not required to do what your brain tells you. Have you ever heard anybody make those, those accusations? Well, God made me this way, and, and I have to fight that urge every day. And I know it doesn't line up with Scripture, but He made it this way, so it must be okay for me. It's in the news all the time, isn't it? You know, and, 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 uh, I, I think of it this way. My body may cry out for alcohol or for a drug. Is it good for my body? Is it good for the people around me? Maybe somebody was selling it to me. Right? Is it good for the people that love me? No. So just because I feel it, should I respond to it in a way that destroys me and destroys people around me? No. So don't let your feelings be your God. Let the Holy Spirit be the God that He is. The loving God that He is and wants the best for you. For if you live by its dictates, your body screams to do the wrong thing. You'll die. 
But if the power of the Spirit you put to death, uh, excuse me, through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your central, uh, sinful nature and you will live. The power of who? Your, your, uh, your self-will? Will that do it? How many have so much control that they can make your, your, your wants and desires just disappear just by your own will? Does that work for you? No. What's it going to take? I, I love the fact, back in the back, it, it, it says the fruit of the Spirit. Spirit of who? Spirit of God. God Almighty. It says love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. Listen to this one. Self-control. That's strange because to have self-control, it takes the power of Almighty God. Isn't that weird? It's fruit of the Spirit. Say a no to self and take in the no. Listen to the no. How easy is that to do? It's not. It's something that we, we train for and we seek through this life. But every time you say no to the body and yes to God, you're loving God. You're giving Him a hug. And you're blazed us a clearer trail for those that don't know that God's worth it. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. If you've got that battle going on inside, you know this is wrong. You know God wants this way. And you battle and then hopefully you win most of the time. But if you've got that battle on, going on, it says right here, if you're led by the Spirit of God, if He's leading you away from the way your body wants to go, and that battle's happening, you're a child of God. Isn't that neat? Who ever thought that battle was affirmation and confirmation that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? You're going to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Praise God for that battle that goes on in us. Victory in Christ is not feeling good all the time. Victory in Christ it is not winning every Christian trophy that's out there on, on the earthly sense. Victory in Christ is being obedient in as many possible things as we can because when we do, we're loving our God. And we're saying, thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming to rescue me in spite of me. I know me. I've known me for a long time. And I didn't make good decisions and still have troubles with him. And yet he still loves me. And so I'm here to tell you about it. I'm no better than you. Amen? Some of y'all know me well, you yeah? <laughs> know? Right? Of course I'm not. We all want what? All of sin comes short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. And after we're saved, we, He's still got some work to do on us. Amen? Through His Spirit. You haven't received a Spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit. When he adopted you as his own children. And now we get to call him Abba Father. You know what Abba means? It's a term of endearment. Uh, how many of you went to your mom or your dad and you said, Mother? Father? About the time you got the father out, they would be looking at you, what you want now, right? Uh, what, what did you call your, your, your mom or your dad? Mama, Papa, or Papa, or, 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 or Daddy? Ours was dad. That's a term of endearment. It, it meant a relationship that went way past the formal place. And that's that Abba. Abba Father. Abba Daddy. We can go boldly to the throne of grace because of what Jesus did. We can go boldly there. And it's a close relationship. And He wants the best for you. That, 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 that distance, that gulf that used to be between us, He's changed because there's nothing between us anymore. Jesus paid for that. Jesus paid for it. How do you get that good news out? Nobody has to go to hell because of what Jesus did. How do you get the good news out that the battle is actually winning because you're having the battle? And if you're having the battle, then that's the Spirit of God in you. You have to, the battle is, nobody likes to hear the word no, you can't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. Right? What does it take to accept the word no sometimes? How many of us wanted that until we became a parent? And usually if we say no to our children, do we mean it to hold them back or do we mean it to help them grow? Just to help them grow, Amen. God who knows everything. If He says no, who is it best for? For us. There is no more loving parent than God our Father. Amen? Let me ask you something. I, 
I, I presented God's word this morning as best I could. I pray the Holy Spirit has filtered it so he got as much of Daryl out of the way as possible and you heard directly from God through his word. That, that's the best possible thing can happen in a session like this. But the question is, did you hear from him? And if you heard from him, if there's anything holding you back from following him or following him for the next step, you may be saved and there's a step that you haven't done yet, but, but you know that he's worth it. Say yes to him. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, Go through the, the mechanics of it are fairly simple, but it has to come through what? A heart or a, a central part of you knowing that Jesus is your only answer to get to heaven. And that's confessing with your mouth that He's your Lord. And believing in your heart. Believing in your heart, not religious verbiage, but truly believing that He was raised from the dead. The Bible said, You shall be saved. When's a good time to get saved? When it comes on your heart. Because you say no to the Holy Spirit long enough and He quits asking. He'll turn you over. He'll turn us over to what the Bible calls a reprobate mind or a mind that doesn't listen to God anymore. That's not something to play with. Amen? It's not something to play with. Those aren't fear tactics. I just want to be sure everybody's well informed. With those thoughts, whatever God's saying to you today, He's right if it lines up with Scripture. If you think God's saying it to you, you don't line up with Scripture, that's not God. God doesn't lie. God doesn't. Not two things. Amen? Let's stand before the Lord.